Well, good morning or good evening, family. It's Dr. Wilson, and it is a Wednesday night uh, window to look through with the Angelos Biblical Institute. I want to welcome you uh, for being here tonight and welcome to our new summer series. That's right. This summer, we're getting ready to release our newest book, and it is called uh, What Every Preacher Should Know. Lessons from the Exodus. Oh my, lessons from the Exodus. So this summer, we're going to be previewing a chapter each week. And I pray that the Lord bless you real good as you study along with this new work that's coming out from our Institute. Tonight's lesson is coming from Exodus chapter one, Exodus chapter one, verses one through 22. And it's titled, Where All the Trouble Began where all the trouble begins. So thank you for watching tonight. Thank you for uh, being a part of our journey and staying in tune with us and praying for us as we're doing the work of the ministry here in Chicago. We bless God for you and bless God for your faithfulness, your kindness, your fellowship, and most of all, your willingness to do life with God together with us. So thank you so much, beloved. Uh, for all of our folks in California, we love to you, love to California, uh, love to Arizona. Uh, our shout out there to our new uh, nephew and niece, brother and sister, Teray Allen Lisbon. Thank you for the wonderful wedding celebration on last week and giving yours truly the privilege to officiate. So God bless you and may the Lord smile on your new journey together. Well, it's study time. Can I open us with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father, we are grateful tonight for the privilege to gather again as your children under the authority of your word and to learn from this new book that you have given us, Lord, uh, what every preacher should know about the Exodus. Thank you, Lord, for giving us such a divine privilege and opportunity. We love you. And we thank you for allowing us to study, to learn, to gather, and to grow together. Bless our time together. Bless every preacher, Lord, who will be watching this, this broadcast and who will be participating in the study. Would you meet them? Would you help us to glean lessons from this study that we may grow our congregations, our work thereby? And Lord, we'll give you the honor, we'll give you the glory, and we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Grab your copy of the scriptures, beloved, and come go with me to Exodus chapter 1 tonight. Exodus chapter 1 and verses 1 through 22. All right? So I'll wait till you grab your copy of the scriptures, and then you can read along with us as we study, um, study God's word. So thank you again. Thank you so much, all of you who are uh, diligently praying for the Wilsons on this journey and who are faithfully supporting the work of the ministry uh, thereby also. Thank you. We could not do this work without you and your, your generosity. So thank you again so much, so, so very much for all that you do. Amen. I uh, want to thank also, before I dive into the text, uh, my brother, Dr. Rodney Kroon, for the ministry of uh, First Baptist Church there in Palm Springs and all that they're doing to advance the kingdom of God. So shout out to you, Brother Pastor. Thank you for allowing your brother to come and serve in your ministry there with you. Amen. All right, Exodus chapter 1, 1 through 22. Hear the word of the Lord. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, with his family. There was Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, the descendants of Jacob, who numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now, Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation had died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful, for they multiplied greatly, increased in number, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. 
Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing to, he came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. So come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and they worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Did you catch that? The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose name was Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, then kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. No, they let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They're vigorous and they give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, God gave them families of their own. And when Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, and when he heard this, he gave this order to all his people. He said, every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but every girl shall live. Amen where all the trouble began. Family, the first chapter of Exodus sets the stage for the narrative of God's people and their need for divine intervention. It introduces for you and I the situation in which the Israelites find themselves. This text also highlights their dire circumstances, and the necessity of God's deliverance. You see, in the midst of their hopelessness, God was going to demonstrate his power, his grace, and his own sovereign way of providing them a way out of trouble. This passage on tonight is a profound passage because it helps leaders, pastoral leaders, leading congregations, is going to help you to discern how God will also work in your ministry, in the lives of your people that are encountering satanic systems in a fallen world. So let's look tonight at this first point from verses one through seven. Let's look at the sons of Israel in Egypt. I think this will bless you tremendously. The Bible teaches us, first of all, that these are the names of the sons of Israel. That's Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, Jacob, each one with their own family. Well, who were they, brother teacher? I'm glad you asked. There was Reuben. There was Simeon. There was Judah. There was Issachar. There was Zebulun. There was Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And in all, Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there and in a ruling position in the government. 
In time, the text teaches us in verses one through seven, Joseph and all his brothers died, ending that generation, that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many, 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 many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and they filled the land. Now, here's what I noticed in verses one through seven, family. In the opening verse, Jacob is referred to both as Israel and as Jacob. When he's called Israel, this signifies the covenant blessing and the people of God that Yahweh had his hand on, while his name Jacob refers to the individual patriarch. Did you catch it? So there was a covenant blessing in verses one through seven that causes the exponential growth of his people in the passage. Second thing I noticed, Joseph's remarkable journey from betrayal by his brothers to becoming a ruler in Egypt is recounted in the Genesis narrative between Genesis 37 and Genesis 50. You all remember that story. Go back and read it when you get a chance. Well, Joseph's rise to power was instrumental in saving his family during a severe global famine. And it was a demonstration of God's providential care of his servant in the midst of a dying and difficult, dangerous, death uh, defeating world. Listen, God's favor was evident as the descendants of Jacob multiplied and flourished in Egypt. Now, this growth was a testament to Joseph's godly heritage and the blessings of a life lived with integrity. Did you hear me, brother leader, sister leader? Did you hear me? As leaders, here's the application. You and I have a responsibility to leave a godly legacy for our children. Just as Joseph's obedience and faithfulness brought blessings to his family, our actions can also impact future generations positively that come from us. Did you catch that? Oh, beloved, there's nothing more than I, than I desire than my children's children and their children to inherit prosperity, peace, and powerful blessings from God because of their grandpa and great-grandpa's faithfulness to Yahweh. Did you catch it? Well, secondly, in Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, we see now in the narrative the betrayal of the Egyptians. The betrayal of the Egyptians. Let's unpack that. In verses 8 through 10, in your Bible, it should read that then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing to, he came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. So come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they'll join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. Oh my, beloved. When we come to verses eight through 10, Moses, the writer of the text, is teaching us that a new Pharaoh came to Egypt. And he was a Pharaoh who knew nothing about generations past. He knew nothing about the Hebraic legacy and how the Hebrews came and saved Egypt 
from famine. He knew nothing about the man named Joseph who served his granddaddy, Pharaoh. He knew nothing about the blessing that God's people had brought to them in the fallen world. And as a result of not knowing the history and the legacy and the people of God, he said to the people in his day, his generation, look y'all, the people of Israel have now outnumbered us and they're stronger than we are. So we better make a plan to keep them from growing even more stronger. For if we don't, and if a war breaks out, they're going to join our enemies and fight against us. And then they will escape from this country forever. Here's what I noticed in these two verses, verses 8 through 10. Number one, this new Pharaoh arose, was unaware of Joseph's contribution to Egypt. This king, he viewed the growing number of Israelites as a threat to their national security. Did you hear me? He saw these people that God had blessed as enemies instead of blessings and brothers. Did you catch it? Number two, Pharaoh's fear, this new Pharaoh, led to him coming up with a plan to suppress the Israelites and to prevent them from becoming even more powerful than they already were. See, this enemy, he represents on the pages of scripture, one who was what we call a type of Satan. He is not Satan, but he is a type of Satan. How? In that he sought to disrupt the prosperity and the peace of God's people ultimately aiming to take them into slavery. That's exactly what the devil wants to do today with our generation, beloved. He, the one who is ruling and running systems of this world, wants to take our generation and drag them into bondage and to slavery. Why? The, so that he can have control and total domination over them. Did you catch it? Let's look now at the brutality of the Egyptians in this passage. In verses 11 through 14, here's what we need to know as leaders of God's people. The Bible says, so they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and they worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar with all kinds of work in the fields. In all of their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Oh, my beloved. Here we discover. So the Egyptians, in verses 11 through 14, listening to this Pharaoh, this enemy of God's people, make the Israelites their slaves and they appoint them brutal slave drivers over them. Why? Well, they were hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They were hoping to uh, uh, um, um, break their backs and their spirits. And so they forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramesses as supply centers for the king. That's right. So these were store cities in the land of Egypt. And they built these major cities and they were to store the things they were making there for the Pharisees. I'm sorry, for, for Pharaoh who would collect more and more and more and more. But the more the Egyptians oppressed the Israelites, the Bible says, the more the Israelites multiply and spread. And the more alarmed, 
the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians, beloved, worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter. They forced them to mix mortar and to make bricks and to do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all of their demands. They worked the fields like slaves, as slaves. Doesn't it sound familiar? Of course, African-Americans understand this narrative because we were brought here and forced to work in the fields to build up a nation. That's what's happening in Exodus. Did you catch this? Beloved, the Egyptians in this passage subjected the Israelites to harsh slavery, hoping to break their spirits through relentless labor. Now, despite the oppression, the Israelites continued to grow in number, causing further alarm among the Egyptians. Did you hear it? Nothing they could do could break God's people's spirit or break their backs or cause them to stop growing. They continue to grow and to spread and to get stronger and stronger and stronger. Now, why, you might ask? Because the Lord was with them. He was with them because of the heritage and the lineage of his faithful servant, Joseph. They are they're benefiting from Joseph's blessings, even though difficulty comes along with that. Well, we've looked at the brutality of the Egyptians. Let me show you now the battle of the Egyptians. The Bible says in verses 15 through 22, keep your text open there. Exodus chapter one, hear the word of the Lord. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Now the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? And the midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They're vigorous and they give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because of the midwives, or because rather the midwives fear God, he gave them families of their own. And then Pharaoh, he gave this order, this is a new order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must now throw in the Nile, but let every girl live. Wow, let's unpack this. This we call the Battle of the Egyptians. According to the text, verses 15 through 22, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave an order to two Hebrew wives who were mid midwives of, for the Hebrew people. This is like hospital nurses going to help uh, young ladies who are giving birth to deliver. Their names are Shipra and Pua. Remember that. God identifies his servants who are working with those who are oppressed, but who are blessed. Did you catch that? Pharaoh, this type of Satan operating this wicked system of oppression, tells these two servants of God, when you go to help these women as they give birth and watch them as they deliver, if that baby that's born during childbirth is a boy, I want you to kill him. If it's a girl, you can let him live. But the text says, when he tells these women this, 
He does not know that these women that may be employed by the government work for the Lord also. <laughs> Did you catch it? The Bible says, because Shipra and Pua feared God, yes, they refused to obey the king's orders. This is good right here. You see, they allowed the boys to live too. So the king of Egypt, when he found out that these midwives had done this, evidently he had saw the numbers increasing in the populations with the boy children. He summoned them before him to give an account. And they say to him, Pharaoh, the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. Mm -mm. They're more vigorous. And they have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. And as a result, God, he was good to these midwives. Oh, yes, he was. Why? Because they refused to obey Pharaoh when they knew to obey Yahweh. Did you catch that right there? Because they feared Yahweh more than they did their earthly government leaders. God smiled on them. And the Bible says, and as a result of these two women, mm, 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 the people continued to multiply and to grow more and more powerful. Did you catch that? Ladies, listen, there's a role you play in society. And that role in childbearing and delivering, right? And the nurturing and the caring for baby boys and baby girls is from the Lord. And the Lord will not have you to abort his image in the earth because the government has a problem with a demographic being born. Are you with me here? God honored Shipra and Pua for their obedience to him and to the love of their brothers and their sisters. This is powerful. Oh, yes, it is. Now, when we see this also, we also see that Pharaoh gets extremely angry when he discovers what has happened. So then Pharaoh calls all of his people. Notice that switch? He's no longer talking to Shipra and Pua. He gives a new order that now his people are to go and collect every newborn Hebrew boy and throw that baby boy into the Nile River. But they were to let the girls live. Now, here's what I notice in verses 15 through 22 of Exodus 1. Pharaoh's decree to kill all newborn Hebrew boys was a direct attack on the future of Israel. Stay with me, class. That's very important for you to know that. He aimed to destroy the male lineage. Why? To prevent potential rebellion. Did you catch it? If he wiped out a generation of men, he had no problems knowing that he could conquer the women. Did you see that there? Remove that male generation and now I'll be able to dominate the Hebrew people. Secondly, we see in verse 15 through 22, the Hebrew midwives, Shipra and Pua, because they feared God, they defied Pharaoh's orders. You need to know that right there. By preserving the lives of the boy. And as a result, God rewarded their faithfulness with families of their own. That's huge right there. See, God does reward servants who will not yield to the wicked systemic systems of a fallen generation under a satanic demigod who wants to rule and reign over men and to squash the imago day of God in the earth. He'll reward you 
when you don't obey those laws of the land. See, where there's God's law and there's man's law, God's law always trumps man's law. If man's law wants you to disobey God, you disobey man. Can I get a witness right there? Today in our world, we face similar spiritual battles, leaders. Listen to me. The enemy seeks to destroy God's people and he has particular targets like the younger generation. See, as leaders, we must stand firm, protect our children, and guide them in the ways of the Lord. Why? So that they can become the witnesses of the future and the carriers of the covenant into the communities that are contagious and are dying from the wages of sin. Beloved, we must be vigilant against modern day pharaohs who seek to enslave and destroy generations through various means. Like what, Pastor? Such as drugs, immorality, spiritual apathy. Are you with me here? We must watch out for these satanic systems that are in place to destroy our babies, to throw them in the Nile River. I'm so glad for Shipra and Pua, who become sisters with a God agenda. They become sisters who rather disobey Pharaoh, that they may obey the laws of Yahweh. Isn't that powerful? That's powerful, beloved. We need leaders today that'll recognize every law from the government and God's law. Every law from the government does not line up and yield to the plan and the vision and the kingdom agenda of God in the earth. And when we must choose, we must be kingdom people and not people of this nation and people of this community. We must be kingdom people in our praxis, in our practices, and in our proclamation. Well, I want to thank you tonight for watching this window to look through with the Angelos Biblical Institute. Here's the summation of chapter one of Exodus. This first chapter of Exodus, it introduces you and I to the dire situation of the Israelites in Egypt. And it sets for you and I the stage for God's mighty deliverance for his people. Now, despite the oppression and the brutality that's coming upon them, God's plan for his people remains steadfast, that they be fruitful and multiply. Did you catch that? So as ministry leaders, we can draw valuable lessons from this passage about leadership, faithfulness, and the importance of preserving and protecting our spiritual heritage. Did you catch that class? Amen. There are a couple of discussions, uh, questions I have for you, for you to talk amongst yourself now online and learn and um, reflect on this lesson for tonight. Number one, what lessons about leadership can you draw from this passage? What lessons about leadership can you draw from this passage? Remember the example of Joseph, Shipra, and Pua. Number two, how can you ensure that your actions today leave a godly legacy for future generations? And then number three, what steps, beloved, can you take to protect and guide the younger generations in your ministry? What steps can you protect, take to protect and guide your younger generation in ministry? Well, here it is. By understanding and applying these lessons tonight, class, we can lead our congregations with greater wisdom and faith trusting in God's sovereignty and his plan for his people. Amen. Thank you so much 
for watching tonight and logging on. Um, for ministry support for the Angelos Biblical Institute, please go to our website, www.angelosbiblicalinstitute, one word, dot com. Institute.com. Go to our giving tab there. You can click on and support this work that is literally making disciples across the globe. We thank God for this opportunity and teaching ministry. And we want to make sure that you have all that you need, the resources as you lead God's people. Now, remember, every uh, Wednesday night, we'll be right here live on our YouTube page as well on our Facebook, social media link, where we are teaching leaders. There's 52 lessons in this new book that we have written, What Every Preacher Must Know, Lessons from the Exodus, all right? Going to be a blessing. We pray that God bless you, God keep you, God empower you and use you. Hey, we love you and we thank God for you. Communicate with us in the chat section there and let us know what, what you're thinking, what you're hearing God say. And we love you and we will see you, beloved, in the next one. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Peace.